Well, we're continuing in our series entitled, Who Do We Say That We Are? A Wesleyan Understanding of American Identity. And today we find Jesus and the disciples returning to Capernaum in Mark's gospel. And so I thought it'd be good for us to remind ourselves what has happened in Mark in Capernaum leading up to this point, uh, because there's a lot that's been going on. It's actually the place of the first recorded miracle in Mark's gospel. And that's where Jesus exercises an unclean spirit from a man on the Sabbath, which was a little shaky, in the synagogue. And then Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law in Capernaum on the Sabbath. And later that evening, he brings all, they bring all kinds of sick people to Jesus, and they heal them as well there in Capernaum. And it's interesting to note, they waited till evening which meant that it was no longer the Sabbath that day, and so they were trying to respect the traditions of the time, the people were. And later, Capernaum is where Jesus heals the paralytic. Do you remember lowered from the roof? And do you remember what he said before he healed him? He forgave him his sins, which, oh, that was also uh, shaky. Then Jesus calls Levi, otherwise known as Matthew, the tax collector, to follow him as a disciple, and he dines and eats with other tax collectors. Jesus also heals a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath in the synagogue. And so for us, in the 21st century, you know, we've been raised in the church, you know, this kind of thing. This all seems like very benign behavior, but let me just say that there was a lot of subversive activity that Jesus was involved in in Capernaum leading up to this point. I invite you to hear this good word from Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying, and they were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me, welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. The gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O good and gracious God, we give thanks for the gospel of Mark and the reading from today. And as these words come to us anew, we'd ask that You give us fresh understanding, fresh insight, fresh deliberation, fresh wrestling, fresh decisions. Give us a new spirit as we worship you today. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me say that sometimes theologians are more comfortable with abstract ideas than with concrete action. And I say this recognizing that all Christians are theologians simply by nature of what we profess and and how we talk about it. So all of us are theologians and I think we are sometimes more comfortable with discussing it in Sunday school than getting out and doing it. And that's human nature. There was a group of European theologians that were once visiting uh, Mother Teresa in Calcutta, and they were wanting to, you know, understand all the things that she does and were just impressed with being with her. And she said to this, uh, to them, she said, you tried to do what I'm doing, and then you'll be able to enjoy what I'm doing. And they're like, well, okay, you know, and they go around their business. Eventually they come to a child care center, and there was a child playing there in the mud, And Mother Teresa went up to that child, picked it up out of the mud, and kissed it, kissed the child. And then she waited, paused, waited for her guests to do the same, 
None of them did. None of them did. It's not likely that they remembered uh, Mark's passage for us today, uh, from today. They didn't see their Lord and Savior sitting in the mud. <laughs> you know, they saw a muddy, naked child that was probably seen as an inconvenience that would get them dirty, and then they'd have to clean up, and then, you know, it's, it's a mess. And so today we have the second prediction of Jesus, of his passion and the resurrection. And they've returned to Capernaum, and we remember all of those things that he's done in Capernaum that I listed out, the healings on the Sabbath, forgiving a man of his sins, the tax collector being brought in as a disciple, eating with other tax collectors. And you can see from seeing all of those things together, when we put them all together like that, and you think about one town receiving Jesus as a rabbi and him doing all those things, you can see he's really stirring the pot. And if things continue this way, there's going to be a reckoning. That's what Jesus is predicting. He says, look, this is headed towards my death. Can you see it? But he also tells them that death will not be the final say. The systems and structures of this world do not have the final say in this. God has the final say because there will be resurrection. And they don't want to ask him about it. It says they were afraid to ask him. Um, it, it could have been because, remember, last week Peter bun, bungled it so badly. You know, <laughs> he, he tries to get it right. And, you know, and nobody wanted to be called Satan this time, so they just don't say anything. But maybe they don't ask him about it because they really don't believe it. They could have had aspirations still for Jesus. Even though all he said all these things, they still have the aspirations for Jesus coming and being an earthly king, establishing it in Jerusalem, and he would be their true king. And as they were going along to Capernaum, because they had this image in mind, they were arguing among themselves, which one of us is the greatest? In other words, who's going to be the right-hand man? When Jesus sits on the throne in Jerusalem, which one of us is going to be right next to him, sitting next to him, making all the decisions, you know, that kind of stuff. When he comes into power, which one of us is the greatest? And Jesus asked them about it, and, you know, they're silent again. For the second time in this small section, you know, they won't say anything. I think they knew they really weren't on board with the rabbi's plans. They just didn't get it. And it's hard to blame them. Jesus is doing revolutionary things. And he's, he's changing the world and he's turning it upside down. And it's hard to be in the middle of that when you've got expectations <laughs> that it should be normal and everything goes along this way. It's interesting, uh, Ramsey McCullen in his book Roman Social Relations 50 B.C. to 82, 84 describes the situation of the social structure in Rome, he said it's very, it was very different in Roman society in, in the Roman Empire in that day, of which uh, Judea was a part. And he said there was no middle class, and there were very few rich at the very top, and they really liked to sit at the top of the social structure, and they liked to um, let other people know that they were sitting up there. And honor and shame were very important components in this kind of society, and so he, he writes that the upper class is emphasized for everyone to notice and acknowledge the steep, steep social structure that they topped. And he said the rich only wanted to associate with other rich people, and if you were slightly less rich, sometimes they would demean them <laughs> and like kind of put them in their place, and they would hope to climb even higher by, you know, befriending those who are above them in status. So as we think about that was the social structure of the day of those in power, is it any wonder what the disciples were arguing about? When are we going to get our shot? And Jesus is going to get us there. Soon it's going to be our turn. And Jesus' response, kind of knowing what's going on with them, is he takes a child and places it among them. 
And then Jesus not only places the child among them, he identifies himself with that child, and he identifies God with the child. In a sense, he says, whoever welcomes this one welcomes me, but not only me, the one who sent me. So it's almost an incarnational approach that Mark is giving us here, that Jesus says, with identifying with the child, that the idea of Jesus being God in the flesh, and then identifying himself as a child. It's very similar to what Matthew does later. Matthew is a later gospel than Mark. And you remember in the scene in chapter 25 with the sheep and the goats? You know, where Jesus says, as sure as you've done it to the least of these, you've done it unto me. And he identifies six categories of hungry, thirsty, being a stranger, naked, sick, or imprisoned. Now, none of those kind of categories were anything anyone would want to be. (laughs) And... Jesus incarnationally helps us to overcome our reservations for identifying with them or helping with them. And just as he does it for these categories, he does it for a child, which in that day and time was really not any better than the six we mentioned. Children had no rights. They had no kind of uh, ability to be seen or heard. It was much different than how we view or lift up children today or honor children today in our society, rightly so. But in that time, they were property uh, at best. And so Jesus may be indicating to the disciples and to us that when we face power, we're as vulnerable as children are. Remember, Jesus really doesn't have any right to speak in front of the authorities when they claim that he's blasphemous. They turn him over to the Roman authorities in Jerusalem and he's executed as a rebel. And the way he's treated, he doesn't have any more rights than a child would. And his disciples were arguing about who's the greatest among us. Hmm. Jesus seems to say that humility for us is deeply important as followers of God and as his followers, that we've got to approach life and other people and relationships with a sense of humility. That means vulnerability. We don't want to be vulnerable. (laughs) We like to put up our guard, put up our walls, Hold people at arm's length. Don't let them in. Don't get hurt. What does it mean to afford respect to the unrespectable? What does it mean to do that? Aretha Franklin passed away in 2018, I think best known for her song, Respect. Uh, Do you remember that song? It was an Otis Redding song. She added the tagline um, that kind of made it so catchy, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Find out what it means for me, which is interesting, the the idea that she's asking the question that we should delve into the person that we seek to respect and ask them what does it mean to respect them, which may be a novel idea because a lot of times we say, well, I know what it means. Of course I know how to respect you. We may not. Find out what it means to me to respect me. This was going on during the Civil Rights Movement, of course, in 1967. uh, Dr. King was still preaching at the time. Her own father was Reverend C.L. Franklin, who was a preacher and activist. And there were, you know, the civil rights movement was going on, women's rights movement was going on. And so it was seen as a bold song, almost a presumptuous song by some. And she was asked about this from the Detroit Free Press. And this is what she said. She said, I don't think it's bold at all. (laughs) I think it's quite natural that we all want respect and should get it. And we remember Jesus says, whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Last week I said that the Wesley's first rule was to do no harm. The second rule of the people called Methodists is to do good. This is who we say we are, that we are going to do good. This is the Wesleyan understanding of who we are as Americans, that we offer respect and dignity to one another and we lift up those who have no voice 
And we say, we will help you speak. David Leininger, in the book Welcoming Jesus, tells a story about a youth group that went on a hike, and it's supposed to be a, a half-day hike, and they get lost down in Texas, and a half-day turned into past that. It was hot. Uh, anybody at football games yesterday knows the kind of heat they're talking about. It, it, hot kind of hiking heat, and you're out there. One of the boys became dehydrated, and it became scary. Uh, his friend, big, strong, strapping young man, 17, 6'4", you know, big kid, he hiked out several miles. Found, they found the right way. He got uh, help, hiked back in with them to bring him back to his friend. They got a helicopter in there, and when the helicopter came, he rode with his sick friend back to the hospital, and fortunately, it was in time. He's a hero. You know, he saved the young man's life. But while he's there on the vigil, kind of waiting with his friend, you know, he checked in with his parents. Yeah, I'm okay. It's, this is what the situation is. The others had been trucked out, and they're still several hours away. And he realizes it's getting later. He's like, I don't have any money. <laughs> Where am I going to stay tonight? What am I going to eat? And the hospital staff suggested that he uh, try the local shelter uh, that they had in town. And he was not interested in the local shelter. He called his dad back and said, hey, his dad got irate, calls the hospital, you know, th gives him a credit card number, says, my son's not going to be staying in a homeless shelter. And um, this is what the young man said about it. He said, hey, you know, I, I don't have anything against homeless people. I've done my service projects for the church at the shelter at home, but I don't need to stay with them or have them sleeping near me. He's like, ugh. So as a parent of young adults, I understand the father's concern in the story. And as a person, I, I can't say I'd be super comfortable um, staying in shelters. And as I recognize that about me, I think, you know, I'm not so different from those theologians visiting Mother Teresa. We like the outsider in theory. But it's another thing to get down in the mud with them and pick him up and kiss him. I may be more like the disciples than I want to admit. Looking out to see who's the greatest, recoiling when Jesus places the child among them and says, this is your new boss. <laughs> Respect only goes so far, doesn't it? And yet, we are called to be the church, to do good, to offer dignity, I think our country was built upon safeguards for our most vulnerable citizens. And when we remember and empower these, that's when we're at our best. And so we have to say as the church, how do we emphasize these and lift them up? I think our church reminds us that when we think about and look at our own self-importance, and we recognize that for what it is as a facade, that's when we can embrace the words of Jesus when he says, whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Who do we say that we are? Let us not be silent when Jesus asks this of us. Amen.